Hello Avenue, and welcome to this new sermon series in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Today we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 40, so if you've got a Bible with you, it'd be great to have that open as we work our way through it. And I want to begin our time in Isaiah with a question. What do you need most in your life right now? I wonder how you'd answer that question. Maybe you'd say, What I need most right now is just to feel safe and normal again. Maybe you would say, what I need right now is to see my family, my friends again. Maybe you'd say, I just need my boss to go easy on me in the coming days. Again, we can answer that question in so many ways. What I need right now is I need a decent night's sleep. Or I need a holiday. Or I need a husband or a wife. Or a better husband or a better wife. I just need just a little more money. Or maybe you'd answer, what I really need now is forgiveness for the things I've done. I need a fresh start. I need hope for the future. It's a big question. What do you need in your life right now? Widening that to our life as a church family. What do we need at Avenue as a church family most of all right now? Again, there's various ways we could answer that. We could say, well, we need a building of our own. We need to have a clear plan of what the future will look like post-COVID. We need to be able to gather together as a whole church family physically again. Well, the reason I begin with these questions today is because I want us to think together how the Bible, the book Christians believe is the word of God, would answer that question. What does each one of us need most in our lives right now? See, I believe the prophet Isaiah is seeking to help us answer that question in the chapter we're looking at today, Isaiah chapter 40. And according to Isaiah, our greatest need is always the same. Our greatest need is to have a bigger and a truer vision of who the living God is and what it means for us to live in relationship with him. Our greatest need is to see the living God, according to Isaiah. And who is the living God? Well, he's the God of the Bible. He's the God who reveals himself in the book of Isaiah, the God who reveals himself supremely in the person of his son, Jesus. So we're beginning this new five-week series in the book of Isaiah. And the book of Isaiah, if you like, is one of the mountain peaks of the Bible. Isaiah, he's the most frequently quoted Old Testament prophet in the New Testament. And even though he lived hundreds of years before the coming of Jesus, Jesus the Messiah is clearly seen throughout this prophecy. And I just want to invite us all at the beginning of these five weeks to see this time in Isaiah as an opportunity and an invitation if you like, just to soak in the majesty, sufficiency and strength of our God. Just to take the time to to see and have our eyes opened to who God is in all his strength and his grace, in all his power and his mercy, in all his power and his love for us. And it's my prayer that spending this time in the book of Isaiah will bring glory to God and joy to us as we have our eyes opened to who God really is. So we're going to be looking at five passages spreading across the second half of the book of Isaiah. And we're going to see that according to Isaiah, the God who made each one of us, the God of the Bible, is also the God we can trust, Isaiah 40. The God of the weak, Isaiah 42. The God who carries us. Isaiah 46, the God who satisfies us, Isaiah 55, and the God who is Jesus, Isaiah 61. Again, we see that phrase in Isaiah 40 here. Here is your God, declares Isaiah. And Isaiah is confident it is good news when we see who God is, both for God's people to hear, but also that's a message for God's people to proclaim to the world around us. See, the better we get to know the God of grace for ourselves, Isaiah tells us, the more we'll want the people around us to know him too, through faith 
in Jesus. But as we begin this series, I want us to be clear about something. Isaiah is full of majestic descriptions of God. It's full of beautiful poetry. But a book like Isaiah and what he tells us about the living God isn't written primarily for theologians or even primarily for strong, keen Christians. No, Isaiah makes something clear to us throughout the chapters we're going to be looking at. The majesty and greatness of God in Isaiah is primarily good news for weak and weary people like us. It is good news for people who know they've messed up. It's good news for people who know they're not good people. The message of Isaiah is good news for people whose faith is often shaky. It's good news for people like Isaiah's first readers and for people like us today. So as we begin this series, well, who were Isaiah's first readers? Well, they were the people of Judah living in the 8th century BC, preparing to go into exile in Babylon. If you look back at chapters 1 to 39 of this book, Isaiah's message to the people of Judah has primarily been a message of judgment. So the people of Judah, they were God's people in the Old Testament. God had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. He brought them to the land of Canaan, given them that land. And they were God's treasured possession, God told them. And yet, in spite of all God's blessing and love towards them, they had become corrupt, hard-hearted and selfish. They had put their trust in other gods and they consistently failed to love and live for the God who had given them everything including the land they lived in and as a result Isaiah tells them God was going to judge them for their sin in chapter 39 Isaiah tells King Hezekiah of Judah that the time is coming when the armies of Babylon will come and they will destroy Jerusalem and they'll take the people captive into exile with them So as chapter 40 of Isaiah begins, Isaiah is speaking to God's people living in exile in Babylon. Their homeland has been conquered. Their capital city has been destroyed. They were now living in a foreign land under foreign rule. See, as we read these majestic descriptions of God in these chapters in Isaiah, we need to remember something. Isaiah is speaking to people who have lost all hope, whose world has been shattered around them. And what is Isaiah's message for them? Well, amazingly, it's a message of comfort for weak and weary and sinful people. Isaiah is speaking to people who know they have sinned, who know they've ignored and rejected God in their lives. And what does he say to them? He says, lift up your eyes to the majesty and greatness of of the living God. He is stronger and more powerful than you realize and his grace and mercy is far, far greater than you could ever dream. The living God, says Isaiah, is the everlasting God and in spite of your sin and your weakness, he has not abandoned you. He alone has the power to save you and he delights to give his grace and strength to weak and weary people who confess their sin and cry out to him for help. I hope we can see today this is very, very good news for weak and weary and sinful people like us. So let's look at Isaiah 40 together now. Isaiah 40, the God we can trust. Now, the first part of Isaiah's message is found in verses 1 to 11, and it's this. Isaiah tells them, God has not abandoned you, verses 1 to 11. God has not abandoned you. Look at verse 1 again here with me. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Isaiah has a message of comfort for his readers. And it's not just wish fulfillment. It's not just hoping for the best. This is a message from their God, the same God who has judged them for their sin. See, this is the living God speaking to his weak and weary people. And what is his message of comfort? Well, first of all, God tells them, your sin has been paid for, verses 1 to 2. Your sin has been paid for. Look at verse 2 again. 
Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sin. Now, in the Bible, sin is always first and foremost directed against God. And as a result, only God has the authority to forgive sin because he's the one who's been sinned against. So when Isaiah tells his readers that their sin has been paid for, he means that whatever else has happened, God's justice has been satisfied. In fact, Isaiah tells us God's justice has been more than satisfied. Again, look at the end of verse 2 again. The sin of God's people has been paid for twice over, Isaiah says. There is now no doubt whatsoever that their sin has been paid for. Now, at this stage in his book, Isaiah doesn't go into any more detail on how the sin of God's people has been paid for. That remains a mystery until we get to chapter 53 of the book. And there we come across the following description of a suffering servant who is punished in the place of God's people. This is Isaiah 53 and verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Now fast forward to the New Testament and we learn that these words are a description of Jesus suffering and death on the cross for us. See, God himself in the person of his son pays the price for his people's sin. That is the message of comfort Isaiah has for his readers here. There is more grace in God than there is sin in you, he tells us. God himself has paid double the price for your sin. And that glorious truth is then spelt out again in verses 3 to 11. God himself is coming to save you, says Isaiah. God himself is coming to save you. In verses quoted by all four of the New Testament Gospels and applied to the coming of Jesus, we learn that the Lord himself is coming to save his people. Verse 3, a voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. See, as I was telling us here, God will not leave us as we are in exile from him because of our sin and foolishness. No, he is coming to save us and bring us home. Now, at first glance, the news that God is coming for us might be a frightening thought for us. Again, I think of that t-shirt, Jesus is coming, look busy. The sense of actually, well, if God is coming, that's a terrifying thought for sinful people. I mean, look at verses six to eight. According to these verses, we are all like grass. We are physically weak, but also we're morally and spiritually weak. So won't the coming of the Lord just consume us, just burn us up like dry grass? Well, the answer we get in verses nine to 11 is no. The coming of the Lord is good news for weak and weary people. Why? Because when Isaiah declares the message, here is your God, verse nine, the God we encounter is both strong enough and gentle enough to show us mercy if we trust in him. Again, look at verses 10 to 11 for a minute here. I just love the way Isaiah uses different ways to describe the same image, the arm of the Lord. So look at verse 10, first of all. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. See, in that verse, the arm of the Lord is a mighty arm. It's an arm that rules, an arm that breaks the power of evil. But then you look at verse 11. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. See here, the arm of the Lord is what carries his people in their weakness. It's an arm that gathers up the broken, an arm that restores and leads us as we put our trust in him. See, strength and power and gentleness and tenderness, they belong together in the person of our God. This is the God we can trust in this world, Isaiah tells us. 
This is the God who reveals himself to us in Jesus. And in the middle verses of Isaiah 40, verses 12 to 26, sort of build on this good news of who the living God is for everyone who trusts in him. Verses 12 to 26, God is uniquely able to save you. God is uniquely able to save you. See, in these verses, Isaiah piles up question after question in his descriptions of the uniqueness of God. It's as if he's challenging us to think of someone, anyone, who is as powerful and trustworthy as the living God. See, according to Isaiah here, God is the sole creator, verses 12 to 14. He's the creator of all things. Verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Answer, no one, only God, because he is the creator. Or verses 15 to 17, God is the ruler of all nations. Verse 15, Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. God is the ruler of all the nations. And then verses 18 to 20. God is greater than any other gods. Verse 18. With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? See, what does Isaiah want us to see here? Well, to put it simply... He wants us to see the living God is unique. He is greater than any other gods we can put our trust in. And he is stronger than all the forces that stand against us. Just as an example of that, look at verses 25 to 26 and the description we get there of the stars. Now in the ancient world Isaiah was living in, the stars were thought to control people's lives. They could influence the destiny of nations. But look at how the stars appear to the living God. Verse 26, he brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. See, instead of viewing the stars as a rival to him in power and influence, the Lord cares for them like a proud dad with his children. He sustains them. He makes sure not one of them is missing. Can you see what Isaiah is showing us here? There is just no comparison between the power of the stars and the power of the God who created them. The living God is uniquely powerful, Isaiah tells us. And just as he cares for each one of the stars, so he also cares for each one of his people. Therefore, let's put our trust in him and him alone. And Isaiah carries on this idea in the closing verses of Isaiah 40, where we truly get to glimpse the true glory of God. See, up to this point, Isaiah has made it clear about the unique power of our God. But in these closing verses, he wants us to see how the living God chooses to use that unique power to serve and to save his people. See, in these verses, we learn something astonishing about the living God. God delights to give strength to the weak and to the weary. Verses 27 to 31. God delights to give strength to the weak and to the weary. See, in these verses, we learn that no one is too small to be important to God or to be unworthy of his care and attention. See, not only is God strong in himself, verse 28, he also gives strength to the weary verse 29. And that is why Christians worship him. That is why he is worthy of all our trust in this world. Again, look at verse 27 for a moment. This is a complaint from God's people. It's a complaint that's been on the lips of every single human being ever since Adam and Eve first ate the fruit in the Garden of Eden. And it goes something like this. God, I'm just not sure that you love me. I'm just not sure that you want the best for me. Look at how verse 27 puts it. My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. In other words, God doesn't care about me. God doesn't understand what I'm going through. That is the complaint so many of us have about God. But how does Isaiah respond to that complaint? Well, he does so in verses 28 
to 29. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. See, what's Isaiah telling us here? He's telling us God is not limited like us. And that is very, very good news. Where we grow tired and weary in this fallen world, God never does. When we don't understand what's going on in our world or in our lives, well, God understands it perfectly. And he's not only strong in himself, verse 28, he delights to give strength to the weary and to the weak, verse 29. See, the God of Isaiah 40 uses his great strength to help his people, to serve his people, to comfort his people. And it's really worth spelling out for us here. Who are the people the Lord helps? The answer is the weak and the weary. It's not the strong, the impressive, the beautiful, the super spiritual. No, the people God helps in Isaiah 40 are the weak and the weary. They're people who know how much they need God's grace and mercy. They're people who know they can't make it on their own. They're people who know their only hope in life and in death is the undeserved grace of God towards us in Jesus. See, what qualifies us to benefit from knowing this God of Isaiah 40? Well, very simply, our only qualification is our weakness and our weariness without him. So as we finish our time in Isaiah 40, I wonder, how are you finding your life at the moment? I suspect that for many of us, we have all experienced times of weariness and weakness maybe particularly over the past year. The weariness of lockdown and the restrictions on all of our lives. But perhaps more than that, the weariness of being stuck with ourselves and with the state of our own hearts. There's been nowhere to hide from our sinful hearts over the past year. And speaking just for myself, I've often been left feeling so weary with myself, with my failures, with my sin and my selfishness, with my cold heart towards God and towards others that just seems to persist year on year. See, we don't have to live long in this fallen world before we're left feeling weak and weary. And Isaiah was all too aware of that fact. But that is why he has this message for us in chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 is good news for weak and weary people like us. Isaiah urges us all here, whenever you feel your weakness and your weariness, go to the Lord, talk to him about it, ask him to help you and to renew your strength as you put your trust in him. See, verse 30 reminds us, even the very best, the youngest, the freshest people stumble and fall in this world. Human strength and human wisdom are just not reliable. But verse 31, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I remember an older Christian I knew just loved this verse, because for him, it described all the different seasons of the life of a Christian. See, sometimes we feel like we're soaring like an eagle. We're deeply aware of God's love and grace and we rejoice in it. Other times we feel like we're running the race before us. It's a bit more effort, but we're making some progress. And then there are other times when it's all we can do just to keep walking and not faint. Everything feels like a struggle. You see, whatever the season of life we may find ourselves in, my friend used to say, God's grace towards us and his love for us always remains the same. And that is a precious truth for any Christian to hold on to. See, if you're a Christian watching this today, whatever season of life you find yourself in, whether you're soaring, you're running or you're walking, Isaiah urges you put your hope in the Lord, for he will never let you down. He will never abandon you. 
He has paid the price for all your sin at the cross of Jesus and he delights to give strength to his people whenever they cry out to him and put their hope in him. So what will it look like for you to put your trust in the living God this week? Well, the one big application that comes to me from Isaiah 40 is simple, yet I'm terrible at doing it. See, placing our hope in the Lord means praying to him. It means stopping trying to run ahead of him. It means stopping trying to solve our own problems or stopping trying to avoid our own problems. No, placing our trust in the Lord means admitting our weakness, but then crying out to him to give us his strength. And remember what qualifies us for that? It's admit that you're weak and you're weary without him. See, with all the uncertainty we're facing in our lives, all the uncertainty we're facing as a church at the moment, I've been really struck by something in the past couple of weeks. I hate being weak. I hate not knowing what the future will hold. So I want to live as if I'm in control of my life, as if I can somehow fix whatever problems come my way. But the reality is, I can't. And the reality is, none of us can. But here is where the message of Isaiah 40 becomes such a precious one. You see, I don't have to pretend I have all the answers. I don't have to pretend that I'm strong. Instead, I can admit my weakness and my weariness. And I can cry out to God and ask him to renew my strength and to keep renewing my strength day by day by day. See, Isaiah chapter 40 is good news for weak and weary people like us. Why? Because it shows us who the living God really is and it assures us he really is the God we can trust in this world. He's the God who will never abandon his people. He's the God who's uniquely able to save his people. He's the God who delights to give strength to his people when we are weak and weary. So let's stop trying to make it on our own. Let's draw near to the living God and ask him to help us live lives that bring glory to him in this world. Look at verses 28 to 29 again as we finish. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. So let's be people who hope in the Lord this week. And let's be a church family who urge one another and the people outside of our church to put their trust in the Lord too in the days ahead. Mm-hmm.